Okay. Good. It's good to go now. Yeah. My, I, I don't think phone calls will come through, but you never know. Yeah. yeah I, I, I've done podcasts and it's like all the, all the best and most relaxed times are just before they start recording or just after. And you're like, yeah, this is what I really meant. Right. It's, yeah. I'm still learning how to do this. Um, no, there's no learning. The more, the, the better people are at that, the, the more of a, a mistake they make on that. Like when it's recording, you know, they go into like anchorman mode or something. Yeah. And, and they think they're being professional, which they are, but they're also putting their, their guest, you know, on edge. Yeah. I definitely <laughs> fall into that a little bit. I kind of put on a little bit of an ego mask or something and try and have yeah, a I mean, more propriety. And that's civilization. That's fine. But I'm yeah. just, Anyway, okay, I mean, we got to be careful either way. So uh, just emptying the pockets here. So what's our, what's our like first question? Um, I don't think I, I had more of a, less of a question and more of a sort of a theme um, that characterizes your whole work really is okay. beauty first epistemology. And I was just hoping maybe you could round that out a little bit, talk about it. How's my volume level? Is it is it good and everything? I think it's good. Okay. How's mine? <clears throat> Can't hear Very good. Sense. Actually, maybe I could raise it a little bit on, on my side. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, yeah, so what about the beauty epistemology? Yeah. Yeah, you know. I mean, think, think of one way to think of it is that... Um, you know, life has been around for some period of time. Okay, we don't know exactly how, you know, was this, how complex organisms appear, right? Like the Cambrian explosion and all these things. So I'm not like a, you know, I'm not a, a, um, an uncritical subscriber to the theory of evolution. But in any case, the geo, what, the, what we understand of the geological record is life has been around for, I don't know, two, two, two and a half billion years. Super long time. Long time. And, <laughs> and during that time, every living thing is faced with um, problems. Someone has summarized these problems as it has to exploit known resources. It has to, uh, every living thing has to defend against known threats. And then thirdly, it has to, um, you know, d discover unknown resources and unknown threats. You know, you've got to constant, constantly be on the lookout. So even the, you know, the simplest you know, single cell organisms are somehow reacting, is what I'm trying to say, to their environment. And in as much as they're reacting, they are, you know, in our terms, processing information in a successful way, pr pr processing information with a purpose and the purpose of survival and propagation and all that. So the point of that is knowing, you know, knowing is two and a half billion years old. And, you know, the, the human mind, you know, in Homo sapiens is two, 300,000 years old. Okay, you, you push that back into other hominids or whatever, but it's, 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 a, it's a young thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the cerebral cortex, I mean, actually, you know, the, 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 the frontal lobes and we're in our highest ranking intelligence and all that, these are so late to the game. So that means within the, the history of life are just, you know, over a billion years, two billion years of solving problems without the aid of truth first approaches or really analytical approaches. Yeah. You know, we, these, people are, you know, people. Uh, organisms are sensing and they're reacting. So aesthetic modes of knowing, I mean, that's how we would call it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's gotta be fundamental. How yeah. is it that we can then go on and build a school system and a civilization and blah, 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 right. Where nobody walks in bare feet. You know, you don't have, you're obviously cutting out, you know, your whole uh, patrimony of, of forever. Yeah. I really like that you take all the way back to non-being and you go with this Eros first, beauty first approach, even to creation. 
and you know um, non being being called out of non being by a by a love by an eros for being i think that works really well also in all different kinds of scales um i was just listening to jp marceau and john Fervanke talk about how you know children are kind of brought out of their self-identification by their eros for their mother and this like differentiation occurs um actually that this question was at the end of my sheet but um yeah how do you see how do you see that working because i kind of you talk about how that eros is the same thing that has to happen for us to rather than being kind of this goodness first moral imperative to start acting right in things it's to fall in love with christ first and then and this ties us back to my first few questions which were about this kind of ontological way of knowing this participative way of knowing um mm. where it's a conforming of oneself to the beautiful rather than just sort of like a i don't know scrubbing away of bad bad blemish you you mean you mean um, how does that work for children or how does that work for people on the spiritual path? Well, or, how does it? Yeah, so we have like all of these different levels. Yeah. We have like the level of kind of primordial creation. Then we have the level of the soul conforming itself to Christ, and then we have all of these levels like relations between people, and then you have even like you could postulate that there's this openness in the liturgy in a city that might also there's some might be an erotic component to that where it's yeah. pursuing like the eschaton or something like that. yeah it's it's tough because you know a scientist or a philosopher can really attack us for anthropomorphizing everything sure i mean but but i, I will say that you know complexity theorists you know atheist complexity theorists you know you know, what I mentioned about problem solving and, and life forms, you know, they mention it, they'd say like a river, a river delta, right, that mm -hmm. the way that the force is at work, and the flow of a river and the sediment depositing into, you know, a larger body of water, those, those forces at work are resolved, you know, in a, in a way that generates some pattern, right? Yeah. So in a, in a sense, you can think of that too as sort of something is com something is being computed to create this. Now, they they look at that, you know, um, they look at that the way let's say nature is solving problems. You know, the, what happens you know, when two tectonic plates collide or whatever, and the patterns that emerge as those forces are resolved in patterned ways. They look at that because they want to be able to say, you know, start from first principles of no God mm -hmm. and build all the way through our human interact re reactions. Um, and that's fine. I don't care. But, but, but for us, we look at it and say, information in a sense is getting processed even at a pre-biological level to, to generate form and a predictable, stable form. Like the universe is not just complete and utter random chaos it has come out of chaos into you know order that even scientists would regard as you know somewhat stable it's been here 13 13 and a half billion years whatever and it looks a certain way every galaxy apparently has you know a supermassive black hole at its center i mean these things are this is the way things are so now um this participatory knowing has to do with the way in which you know biological knowing or or this duty first knowing it, it generates well I, I won't i don't want to use that word yet it 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 is hypersensitive to local conditions right it is um a phrase i like to use omnivorously sensitive to lo local conditions that's why no two snowflakes are alike because just this, this just the most infinitesimal change you know mm -hmm. and humidity and all that but you get a different look so, so that's a kind of participation, right? It is always, the environment's always reflected in the thing. And, and we decided, you know, as human beings, just at some point that, you know, wait a second, the environment has an element of chaos. We want to get out of that. We want to get, you know, these clean lines of linear order. And, and that's good too, but it, but it doesn't, 
you know, dispense with the need for the other thing. Mm-hmm. But that does, none of that gets to Eros, so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, there's a, a lot to unpack in. The, the, the Eros is in that, that living things and just existing things are so open to the, the other, to their environment. I mean, they're so, they're so interwoven with their yeah. ecological, you know, niche or something. Yeah. William Blake says Christ loves us through particulars, which is, it's kind of like this, you know, the Logos manifests in this kind of infinite variety of ways through the Logoi in St. Maximus's terms. Um, and, and you, and, and you, um, I talk about this in chapter six of, of my book of the ethics of beauty, that, that there's some coinciding of, of freedom and necessity or of particularity and universality in real, in, in real art, you know, in real yeah. life. Yeah. So Christ loves us through particulars and opens us to, you know, everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he has, you know, heaven, heavens and a wildfire, you know. Right, right. If, if, you've, if you've fallen in love with one particular person and been totally helpless before him, you understand everyone. Right, right. Yeah. You, you don't understand anyone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, that kind of opening out. I think the phrase you use is uh, giving up an infinity of possibilities for possibility of infinity. Yes, I, I, that needs to become a bumper sticker. I think it's a good one. Yeah. T-shirt. It's a good one. <laughs> good good that's the yeah. offer that's that's what's on offer to to every existing thing yeah so do you see cult like culture and art as basically a project in in liturgical theophany mm. what, 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 how so mm. well you use you you mention or i may have misread this but I think you make the case a little bit that um, good patterns that resolve all the tensions in the their environs show forth the uncreated order to a certain degree. Hmm. Um, so a rightly ordered city, or I think like in poetry, if you have a poem that is internally coherent, that's very important to its pleasure pleasurability. Like. Uh, so there's this way in which, you know, the patterns have to be accountable to themselves. Um, so basically, like if, if a city shows fidelity to the uncreated order in, so if it's healthy in a, in a term, I think, a word you like to use? Um, so is that theophanic in a certain way? Yes, it definitely is. I mean, when you, when you, you know, it could be just a moment, you know, of a performance of, a, you know, of a, an artist, you know, when they, when they're locked in and so, somehow, yeah, it's, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing God, although, you know, they're not God, but they're right. somehow they are, you know, just displaying. Yeah. <laughs> they may feel like God and they, they, they ought to feel God. I mean, they have to feel the kingdom of heaven is within them and it's kind of you know, shining out there. But the, the thing is, it's like, you know, the, that's not the aim. The, the point of Eros is that, you know, you're aiming for something other and then these things happen. They're just um, entailments. Is that Lonergan? Logical entailments. They're like, you know, they're, they're, they're things that come along for the ride. And that's right. how you want them to aim at them specifically to aim at beauty in particular, you know, is, is harder. Yeah. It kind of has to be a consequence. And I think that's like the older conception of art um where it's not for its own sake you know it's always in service to something right you die the artist dies the podcaster dies and god appears like that's the that's the that's the deal that we're making and it's a good deal yeah yeah take yeah i was just uh (laughs) reading before we got on from i don't remember which chapter but you were saying exactly that basically the iconographer is trying to get rid of himself in a certain way so that christ will shine forth and that's how it becomes theophanic yeah and, and you're not this, you know your your you is is changed after that like your mm-hmm. 
the, your base level is higher or whatever the word is. You know, you just, you just, there's an extra line on your face or something. Or, sure. Yeah. A yeah, teardrop. <laughs> Hope not. The uh, spiritual equivalent of a teardrop. To, you, you've died. You've killed someone. It was yourself. And yeah. the, the uh, <laughs> and now, and now, yeah. So, so then, you know, the inspiration leaves, the moment leaves. You may not get it back for, you know, a little while or a long while, but it's okay because, you know, some new process is in, in motion here. Yeah. 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 So just broadly, could you offer a theological imperative for, and especially paraliturgical art or, or, or extra liturgical art? Um, why is it, you know, I mean, it's, kind of self-evident to me as an artist but but broadly why is it something that's important i i know that's sort of why is parallel why is paraliturgical or art outside? Well, i guess religious art or something why is it important that the mundane is beautiful that we take time to craft you know yeah. that we that we don't mass produce chairs and and things like this oh um, I mean, to ask why it's important in a way is to ask why it's good. And, and I think um, something as big as what you're asking is it's all of life. Yeah. You know, I don't want to hone in on just the level of the good. So, sure. so, so it's more a question of what is life? And, and life is this. Um, Life is life. I don't know what life is at the moment, but it, it it shows up in this rich fractal order. Sure. And every every level is filled. Yeah. So so the more we're in tune with life, and for for me that's Christ. For for us that's Christ. The more we generate order at scale. In other words, at every scale. Mm -hmm. And that order is beautiful but the the intensity of that beauty let's say it's 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 whatever it's visibility or something is also um is also fractal like you know a, a great novelist let's say they write 20 20 novels and short stories you know <laughs> some of them are just even if you love them all they're not equal. It's, it's yeah. just it's a, it's a hierarchy. So right there, there's a hierarchy, um, and and so I don't mind, you know, mass produced this or schlocky that or fast food. I don't care. I just don't want all of existence to be collapsed to that level of the hierarchy yeah. in the name of some absurd ideology of equality. Yeah, and and I and I just. <laughs> We're just asking, well, those who can create something more, or those who must, you know, or those who, those who want to, whatever the word is, we want to support them if we can, because we must. <laughs> we, 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 want, we want that, you know, we want that around. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is that part of that fidelity to that? to beauty really it, it is it is fidelity to life which shows up as yeah. as as order as cosmos which mm -hmm. by its definition you know we get our word cosmetic yeah but, but not everything is you know like you know it's like the the peasant woman's face or something it's it may not be pretty in any in any sense that you know it may even be the opposite but it's beautiful on some other level and not just because of some ideology it's it, it is beautiful to the eyes that can see yeah and um, yeah. we want more beauty like that i don't think we need to fight against you know like the fast food thing i think what we need to do is is to we need to fight for the cross because it's it's all this lower level art it's also it's just so easy we can just turn on the radio turn on the tv go through the drive-through and live at that level. And 
that comes naturally or something that comes easy. So fine. You don't have to worry about that. Right. But, but the other stuff that takes more of, um, you know, someone may need to go to art school for years or apprentice with someone for a long time, or we as a family, let's say you have a family may need to say, you know, on this day of the week, we're having a kind of family night of some way, shape or form where we don't, you know, anyway, it's, it's, anyway, it, that's all. But just fight for the higher levels of the hierarchy and the lower levels will take care of themselves and you'll be quite quite grateful that they're around at different moments. Yeah. I, I took a long trip across Northern Greece in a car and there were no, there were no uh, fast food. I, you know, it was going west to east. I was super dehydrated. I was super sleepy. I was driving a rental car. I just needed a McDonald's because I had to make a flight. And it's just not there. And you're like, geez, what the heck? Yeah. This is from Corfu to Thessaloniki. And yeah, however, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, again, hierarchy. It's, a, it's okay to have the bottom as long as you have the top, but it feels like a lot we don't have the top. No, we don't. Yeah, so. No, it's been outlawed, banned. It's been. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. harder. It's more of a cross to, to devote yourself to it. Mm -hmm. And colleges and universities are to blame. You know, they've gotten rid of their semester-long art survey courses, music survey courses. You, you, it just takes effort. You have to, like, put yourself down and, and go through it with a master and then take it from there. Yeah, you have to be very deliberate. So you can probably bring Christopher Alexander in here a little bit and talking about the quality without a name in, insofar as we're talking about, you know, to try and account for, I guess, the goodness or the beauty or worthwhileness of, of well-crafted things is kind of besides the point. It's an intuitive, like he, it's deeper than, than the, I guess, explicit I, I think what, what you know comes out, in, especially in the later Alexander, his four-volume work, *The Nature of Order*, is that you know what the artist is looking for is not necessarily beauty, but or not only beauty, but but as they're crafting, they're, they also arrive at a familiar feeling within themselves that tells them this thing is done. It's is what it is. It's perfect, and the rest of us you know, can get those feelings in all kinds of, you know, if, if you're not, let's say, a, you know, a woodworker, which I'm not, and it, it could be all kinds of areas in your life where once you know, understand what that particular knowing feels like, and it's, it's not even exact, it's not really sensual, it's not moral, it's not intellectual, it's some combination, it's some spiritual, spiritual thing beyond it all. And you look for those those moments and you do the work until you've reached it and 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 that's it and then you kind of you know the you do the work of let's say the conversation or you're, you're aimed at that at that moment usually it's beauty it's beautiful but again not everyone can you know not everyone can see that beauty you know um yeah it, it, it's almost you know it's a I guess you, the truth, goodness, and beauty are inseparable to, to a certain extent. So it's more a showing forth of a disclosure of reality than it is. Yes, it's reality. It's, it's life. It's living order. I mean, even, you know, even if it's just geologic, it's there's some living order there. Yeah. There's a, Wallace Stevens has, I can't remember the exact line, so I won't butcher it, but I'll kind of make up my own on the theme. He, he basically says like, the dress of a woman of of Paris is a part of Paris made visible, um, and that's, so there's that's so fantastic, yeah, yeah. He <laughs> he has a very wonderful way of so hard to fake. Yeah, yeah, and it, well, there's definitely you can feel the fittedness of certain kinds of art with certain locales. Um, Places have a smell, you know, and you just like, hey, that's what this, that's what, yeah. I don't want to name any places in that. <laughs> People, well, if it's a good smell, it's all right. But <laughs> it, it is this, this is it's the signature, you know. It's like okay, you can't fake that, right? It has to somehow comes from the food and the climate and the soil and God knows what. Yeah. yeah. Custom, cu customs, culture, religion of the people. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, let's see. I have some more themes on this topic. Um, so maybe we can try and build some bridges between culture and history and eschatology. Um, big bridges, obviously, or maybe a bunch of small ones. But um, how do you see, because culture, especially in our American context is largely secular. Um, but there isn't really, there's not a dualism between the tradition of the church and the cultures that it's within. Um, so how do you see the Catholicity and fractality of the church and that living tradition? Well, first of all, you know, it, eschatology is disclosed fractally within history, right? So not every moment is going to pop like, you know, the transfiguration of Christ on Mount Tabor or the second coming or sure. the second coming is kind of outside of even, fra you know, it's just <laughs> it's a rending. But, right. but, um, but every moment has an eschatological import and, you know, it's, it's visible. After the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the uncreated light is shed abroad in the world in some way that it wasn't before. I don't know how or what that means. But when people see the uncreated light, I mean, they might see, you know, a particular saint transfigured. That's a different case. But when they see it sort of in general, you know, it's not that the light appeared per se, but that their eyes were ready in that moment, or were permitted, it was a, this blessing. So, um, so we're living in this eschatological framework since Pentecost, and um, then we just kind of pick our level of participation in that. Like how, how certainly uh, monasticism, because it is the angelic life, it is you know this life of the eschaton. It's a disclosure of the next world. Now, that's a kind of intense. Um, but so is marriage and, um, and so are, are certain other things that, you know, a martyrdom or just um, ordination or just a job well done, <laughs> you know, just a, just a life fully lived. So there's just all kinds of things. And I think, you know, we're, we're so fortunate to have this language of fractals and to, to see them in nature because we're not inclined to denigrate any particular level of the order. It just all adds up, you know? But um, I, I, I don't think we're living in a secular age. What we're living in is, is a machine age that had, that, you know, that sort of ended on, you know, August, whatever it was, 6, 1945, that persists now with increasing, um, elements of a demonic religiosity or um, a kind of, you know, semi, you know, religiosity, a, a, a fast food, acidic. a fa fast food religiosity, just something that's sort of just cheaper. And, and, and so, you know, these two things collide. I mean, I mean, I, I suppose a, a more machine age, you know, would be secular, but <clears throat> clearly when you look at the religious fervor that so-called secular people have, you know, it's more intense than religious people. I think we're probably more secular than they are. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's... We're, we're just we're just living in our suburb and, you know, every air condition, there's just, there's no passion. We're, we're comfortable in the machine, but the, but the, 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 uh, the revolutionaries are not, and I, they, they feel much more strongly the absence of the spirituality and they're willing to, you know, to, to, to act on that. Yeah. But it's the wrong spirituality. I mean, in it's on its own terms, it just does not add up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I was, I've been reading Paralandra, the second book in C.S. Lewis's space trilogy. And he does, he has this kind of, uh, scene where, essentially the main character is is communicating with an eve figure but on venus and he's talking to her from a christian perspective she's very kind of naive and 
still in the Edenic state. And then there's this agent he's, who's kind of Gnostic and pseudo-spiritual. And he's kind of come out of, he's a very good exemplar of sort of, he's come out of this secular rationalism into this kind of Gnostic, um, I don't know, self, self-pleasing, self self-determining spirituality. And it's kind of interesting to watch their dialogue because it's, you're watching the dialogue of our culture right now. Um, so yeah, I, I found that. So, so he's the machine and she's the uh, kind of just a, a more innocent level of, of good faith. I mean, is she, is she, um... she, yeah, she, well, she is, it's, there's kind of C.S. Lewis has this way of, of articulating sort of her naive wisdom in a very, um, in a very careful way. I think it, I think it's profoundly right in some ways. Um, but it's just, it's interesting to see the two narratives, the one being sort of, uh, an anthropology that's reliant upon this dialectic between people, between uh, on communion, and this anthropology that's that is again Gnostic and and um, very critical of of the social order and and these things, and to see how one you know sees in the diminishment of the self. The ability to become more particular and more unique in one season, this continual inflation of of the individuals, I don't know, sp- spiritual credentials, um, sort of the axis upon which history will turn. Mm. Huh. I, you know, this, uh, it's, it's interesting i was on youtube looking for more of your talks to research um yesterday and you know i was going through my feed with all these conversations like ours and there was a thumbnail that said this is the biggest moment in history and i was oh, like well i don't agree with that quite but what was it what was the biggest moment in history just this moment we're living in in other this words this moment we're living in sort of this i don't <laughs> this uh the moment when the AI takes over and exterminates us all. That would be a pretty big moment. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be a big moment. The, Again, um, no. the, the, the issue, I think, is that the, the machine age you know, is the age of... The machine is embodied logic. And yeah. we, we like to think of that as a truth-first age, but it really isn't. It's just, it's just a hyper-moralism. Logic is really at the level of goodness. It's, uh, you know, it's... It's about building a conceptual machinery to prove a point or whatever. And then the machines embody that, that logic. So that they're, they're technology, they're good. You know, science is something else. Um, it's, the thing is, everyone really is beauty first. In other words, in order to get to the point of thinking that you know, the machine is all, we have to have, we have to fail at the level of beauty and have a certain hubris about nature or a certain hubris about the self. And, and we imagine that, you know, but it's just a matrix that we imagine that we're like truth first people being technological or something. We're just sort of failed beauty first people. And you see this really, especially with this whole regenerative agriculture movement that we've, we, we killed our soil, you know, our farming soil in this country you know, through this application of logic and technological additions and anything that would be beauty first, that would be cooperating with cosmos in an erotic way, it was banned as weak and as not, you know, sufficient to the needs of a growing population. (coughs) Our soil is bankrupt. You know, these logic, you know, these goodness first approaches just are absurd. (coughs) Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... I think it's pretty, pretty self-evident that with any reflection that everyone moves, moves through that progression. I mean, to become enamored of a certain way of 
looking at the world of a certain Weltanschauung, you kind of have to fall in love with the myth or, or find it in agreement with whatever your ambitions or passions might be. But, but to me, that is, you know, that is the triumph of secularism the, in, in that destruction of the soil. What we have now is people who are trying to get back to something organic, <clears throat> but are, are traumatized by these decades or centuries of the machine age. They do not have a coherent beauty first um, program on offer. And therefore, um, their, their frustration, their fear, and their rage grows. It takes on a quasi-religious dimension or a religious dimension. And there's just a danger to themselves and others at this point. Um, yeah. But in terms of something like global warming, I mean, to the extent that that really is the thing, regenerative agriculture will handle that almost single-handedly. And that's the direction that we have to go if we're worried about global warming, not, I, I don't know what, not some kind of what weird program of social control. We just need to restore the, the earth. Right. We want to save the earth, restore the earth. Yeah. Lots and of. in a sense, a lot simpler and a lot more fractal too. And, and gentler and milder and you don't have to, you know, but yeah. it does take fervor and takes insistence and, um, and the, the people acting in the most kooky ways, they've got that. They've got yeah. that courage. You know, if, if they ever get onto the right program, you know, they're going to make, you know, right now what they're doing is they're on the wrong program and they're just terrifying people who have common sense because common sense is a lot like beauty first and just like, okay, I can't, I don't have an ideology to, to hand, but I can see this whole thing as a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the, the uh, patterns that occur most in a place are what define a place. So, yes. And, and the, the pattern of everyone is to reject God, uh, especially, first of all, in their, in their romantic life. And then from there to just tumble into greater and greater confusion. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, you, know, you asked about, you know, this kind of knowing at the very beginning. And, and I always say the, the one therapist in this country that you can trust is, is the dog whisperer, Cesar Milan. And he's constantly trying to take his troubled animals and break them down into, you know, first treated as an animal, then as dog, then as breed. And that's what human beings need first as animal and we do that through fasting and chastity then as humans we do that through almsgiving and kind of training and you know education and then as person um that you know we do through through prayer and of course all of this you know is the continuum all it's done in prayer all of it is done with a view to the other but you've got to break it down and and you know and that's where the radicals, you know, another reason why they're right. Like they're like, yeah, the, the, the land, the food, what the heck? And, you know, the secular people really are, you know, many times the Christians who are just comfortable. So long as I'm saved in some other worldly context, you know, I'm totally at, at peace with this machine approach to reality, but the machine, the machine is not the answer. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very limited and, you know, it's, it's, it's ancillary. It's just, it's hurt. It's so hurtful. Right. Yeah. It, well, it's a lack of embodiment, you know, and getting stuck in this, you know, just this solely spiritual intellectual, probably primarily intellectual um, capacity for relating with the world and with other people. Um, I, you, you talk about information is always embodied. It's always, it's always, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, what's his name, uh, Claude Shannon. I, I think that's just information theory is saying somehow mm -hmm. this physicality of information that yeah. it's supposed to be somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But the, yeah, taking upon oneself the responsibility for, for, I, this also goes back to that idea of being, of, of taking upon yourself the, not necessarily duty, but, you know, uh, St. Porfirio says to be a Christian, you first need to be a poet. Um, and I think there's something 
even in one's relationship with ecology, for instance. There's that, there's that um, story of St. Silouan saying to St. Sophroni, when he plucks a leaf or something, your heart was not right. And we, you know, we do more than pluck a leaf, obviously. So, um, but I think that's a, that's a good identification of these, you know, these, these groups that do become, you know, more, as more committed and are more faithful to their ideology than most Christians are to living out the Christian life. And um, so that needs to be answered in this, in gently in a certain way. But um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how the bottom-up cultivation of good patterns works in conjunction with these sort of higher order so like you mentioned, there's these things with legislation and um, soil policies and urban renewal and these things, which obviously have a profound effect on environments, but then there's also kind of the, there's, there is the particular participation in, um, you know, going to liturgy. You talk about how healthy liturgies generate order out of chaos. And I've heard you use the term that liturgies are are an energy field and, and these things. So, and you could think about, you know, just liturgies being where, I mean, obviously uh, the divine liturgy is a little different, but, but liturgy has healthy patterns, you know, within the home and within your place of employment and all of these things, how they work in conjunction with the, I, I guess you could say the higher order of the things coming down, which is the sort of, emergence emanation kind of relationship. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's super complicated. I mean, it just, I, I work in a very small institution and the confluence of, you know, at, as a dean at Hellenic College and just the confluence of prayer, spiritual attitudes. I mean, it's, it's policies, procedures. And it's just, it's not, uh, it's not trivial and order at, you know, civilizational scale or continental scale. It's just a tremendous gift that it's there at all. And mostly it exists because lots of people choose to suffer for love. They put up with a bad boss. They put up with a bad policy. They put up with something and, and do their best to make it right. So they, they bear that, you know, that suffering within themselves. Um, you know, in civilization, everyone, almost everyone is the boy with his finger in the dike. You know, that just, there's no time to call for help. You've got, you know, you're the person who has to avoid the car accident when someone else is driving like a maniac. And you're the person who has to um, support your local business or you're the person who has to, you know, just, there's just a billion things going on. Now, the problem with that is that, you know, people want a plan and they want, um, they want, you know, a, some kind of guidance to order their approach to life. And you can't just say, you know, everything counts, everything matters. It's like saying nothing matters. I mean, yeah. And, and the answer there, you know, really is just, is that there's some that within, that within hierarchies, some moments are more critical. And um, Elder Paisius, you know, he counseled at one time in one of his little talks, he said, don't ask for anything but a spirit of repentance. Don't ask for peace. Don't ask for forgiveness. <laughs> I mean, you ask for those things too, but, but don't ask for help or your problem to go away or to have more children or just be, you know, savage and relentless in petitioning God for a spirit of repentance and see how that inner liturgy, you know, is, is so crucial because now you can start to see how I really am the problem in my life, in my local setting, in, you know, some larger scale, I am the problem. And as I, as I repent that liturgy of repentance, 
brings some order and it spills over. And you find allies who are also repenting. Um, you start your antennae improve and you realize what is, you know, what's just a waste of time and what is you know, a real issue. But that's you know, sort of the personal scale. I mean, you certainly need divine liturgy and access to the Eucharist and participation in the Eucharist. I mean, you, you need that. And, and all the other scales matter too. But I think in an individualistic age where, you know, every other video on Instagram is somehow about how if I have the right morning routine, I'm going to be, you know, mega millionaire. Right. I think it's, it's important to say that, that is the foundation of your routine is that you try to be relentless in that, in that prayer for repentance. Now, it, it, this is, this is personal too, um, you know, um, it, it, the prayer can be phrased in other ways or other, other things. Some people, it's just the Jesus prayer is their devotion and that's that. I mean, it, there's, but usually there's some kind of keystone habit to um, quote this book, The Power of Habit. I can't remember the author's name. It's a New York Times bestseller, but there's a key, there are keystone habits within institutions and within a person, within families, within businesses. And if you imagine that all habits are equal or of equal importance, you will fail. You have to know what, what the linchpins are and you've, you've got to never, uh, um, yeah. Do you have a follow-up on that? I mean, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, yeah, you have to have a cornerstone. And that's true for at the individual scale and, and at the civic scale. I think but that's... The, but the cornerstone is not something like faith, per se. It's something that is some kind of faith in action, right? It has to actually be... Right. You know, not just embodied, yeah. embodied, but enacted, you know, or enacting. Sure, a positive kind of out, outflow. And yeah, there's a, something going yeah. on in a, in a thesis in the sense of uh, like an athleticism Maybe. yeah cu couples will say I mean, it seems simplistic what was the key to our happy marriage we never went to bed angry or something now that's you know, that's their liturgy that's their keystone habit you listen to it it sounds totally lame whatever i'm not married anyway so but i'm just saying but but in fact it's not lame at all it's 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 their keystone habit and it, it worked <laughs> yeah Look, look uh, about all these things, you know, beauty for his goodness, you know, handsome is as handsome does, you know, it's, that's, that's really, you, there, there's, there has to be a kind of empiricism that the beauty first approach keeps us on like, well, 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 what is working, you know, if you're reading my book, and it just doesn't speak to you then just th toss it. Yeah, it's, it's not, a, it's not on a required reading list from God. Yeah, right. the Bible is another story. <laughs> even within the bible you know there's different parts or different i mean different yeah from, sure so so you have to yeah yeah so this kind of i think you maybe would use the term hospitality this hospitality for for the appearance of the beautiful in in your life um yeah it's something that's that's hospitality important. to theophany, you know, hospitality to inspiration, hospitality to those moments that we talked about a second ago. The keystone habit that a, um, a bishop told me in, in Korea was, if you have a good thought, you must do it at once. That was his keystone habit. And it, it's something I can't really live up to, but definitely to my peril when I don't. You know, when I it just, if you have a good thought, just get after it. Yeah. It's, there's no, there, there is no tomorrow. There's just, there's just a, a very long now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a very long, very, a very long yeah. now. No. Yeah. I think when you don't listen, it's so painful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe not at the, uh, at the moment, but downstream, definitely yeah. in another now. <laughs> yeah. And in, in this, Later, yeah, later on in the now, this happened. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. And so maybe this has something to do with this kind of phenomenological unknowing 
coming to people, to persons and experiences with no preconception in order to be, um, I guess, most optimally hospitable to, to things that, you know, when I read a, a poem I've read 40 times, you know, you, you need to come to it as if you've never read it before in order for it to speak to you. Um, if you're reading it as if you've, as if you've, uh, and the same thing with liturgy, in a sense, it has to always be surprising. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, but. Um, yeah, the the, the un unknowing is uh, so crucial. And then, and it's, it, in this context, it points to the, you know, the, the personal or the tri-personal tri for us as Christians, you know, mm -hmm. nature within the Godhead, you know, that it's not just, you know, it's not just divinity that you're, you know, responding to, but the person of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit, and they're prompting you well, they're asking you to do something not out of obedience, but out of loyalty, faithfulness. Yeah. yeah, just, just, just be loyal to this, this fidelity. Yeah, yeah. And then, trust me on this. <laughs> their trust, you know, that they are. That's what they're saying, and they're they're trustworthy. Trust, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, any, if anything is there, anyway. yeah. 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 So I I don't know if you made this explicit in your book, but you had sort of these this chiastic pair there were a lot of chiasms in your, in your work obviously but i don't know if you if you had set this one up explicitly or not but there was the the loving in order to know and the unknowing in order to love um hmm. and you also say like this chiastic inflection point is always christ um and christ crucified so i was, I was wondering like that's kind of a heideggerian idea like the, the loving or the caring in order to know something and, and but also this idea of like this kenosis, this emptying out of oneself in order to know something. Um, do you see that as? I don't know. What do you think about that? No, no. You, you were. Was there more? You were about to say. Do I see that as what? I was gonna. I didn't. I wasn't quite sure how to articulate it. But is there a way in which um, civic liturgy also is 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 doing that? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, people go to the city to pursue their dreams or their love, you know, loves for things like, you know, eating on a regular basis <laughs> to begin with, you know, and uh, good hospitals and whatever, whatever scale you are in, in development. Um, yeah, I think Jane Jacobs saw that, you know, very much that, you know, that, that the city is a liturgy, you know, because everyone is con become so when people are free to pursue their loves. And of course, you know, loves can be, you know, loves can get caught up in our passions and our sins and what our hubris, but um, hopefully there's a kind of check and balance within the city. And, you know, we, we also run into other people who keep us in check. Um, and then the, the, you know, you, out of these loves, you know, you enter this, this great school called the city, this incredible university of life. And, and then you, you know, you practice this unknowing of um, trying to, you know, be open to these moments or be open to opportunities or innovations, um, open to other people who aren't like you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You were saying before, you know, can that healthy city and you know, disclose paradise? I mean, of course, now I think today in our political context, we'd say, you know, let's just be careful, you know, healthy for whom? And, you know, it's there are some people for whom, you know, might be living their best life in New York City, but at this, let's say, let's say just as an example, but then other people for whom, you know, well, the reason that I call it my best life is because I'm free to sexually exploit you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's, I'm not, you know, talking about minors, even I'm talking about some people are, are good at manipulating and. Yeah. Um, A disregard for the other. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, 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 so the, the earthly city is never good enough. It's just that we don't want these 
you know, in Jane Jacobs terms, these impossibly hubristic standards of perfection based on impossibly abstract right. notions of, you know, what's possible in a city. Yeah. You know, everyone has privilege. You know, you have the privilege of existing. Privilege is hierarchical too. And privilege is both a, a gift because it, it says, you know, you do have this added dimension of mobility and power to, to act, but it's a cross because it's saying you will be judged on your use of that privilege. Yeah. And, and now we would add, you would be ju- you'll be judged on your ability to, to raise other people up. Um, sure. Now, America has done that well, you know, for the most part. It's been a place where people come as immigrants and they, um, and, and they, you know, they're empowered over time. But, you know, we can't, uh, I, uh, you know, romanticize it. You know, there's a lot of suffering and a lot of, there's a lot of loss that happens there too, you know, loss of cultures and identities. And Yeah, yeah, there's kind of a shedding of, of the identity. And you could kind of bring this back down too in the same way with this idea of, of privilege, um, which in this example that I'm about to use might not necessarily be the right word, but these saints that are born, you know, by seven years old, they're, they're you know, practicing noetic prayer and these things, but they also have the greatest cross. Um, yes, so, so that is a kind of privilege which some people, you know, are jealous of, you know, but I, I don't think that jealousy is bad. It's just that, you know, be careful what you wish for. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's sort of. Be careful what you wish for and be 10 times, 100 times more careful what you're jealous of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, yeah, might be surprised if you get what you ask for. So. You won't, um, like, it. You won't like it. Yeah, yeah. Mm, well, that's good. I have. Um, let's see. And this kind of will all. Well, maybe you will. People should, I'm not trying to discourage people, but just, you know, get ready. Yeah. Get ready to rumble. Yeah. No, it'd be better. You talk, you, you do talk about that, uh, this kind of worry that can sometimes be in people that, you know, if they renounce the world and all of these, if all of these things, they, they want to hold on a little bit and not give themselves fully. Um, yeah, I'm not if yeah, yeah I, I am too obviously um but if a few people don't lay down that question the question of whether we get to keep yeah yeah, yeah. you do need your heroes i mean they're not he, heroes are like you know the personal equivalent of you know keystone habits they, they're without their sacrifice you know nothing nothing else really matters you know we're not going to um you know you look at let's say in the vietnam war you know, th- th- there was such incredible courage among the combat infantry, you know, in terms of the conditions they faced, the duration of combat, you know, 365 days almost without a break. That didn't happen in World War II. You, know, you went up to the line, front line, you came back. And the, the nature of the enemy, all these things. I mean, okay, so you have, you know, the, that's, that's the best combat infantry, you know, I mean, on an army-wide scale in the history of the United States, right? I don't know, history, the modern, the 20th century history. And, and yet without, you know, generals and, and statesmen and presidents and politicians who could just see what was really happening, you know, it did not, it wasn't for nothing. You know, it, 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 it had positive impacts in the region, but certainly it didn't lead to the outcome that was promised. So, yeah. And who knows, maybe it was all betrayed at the end and there was some kind of secret deal with China. I don't know, but the, you know, that they wanted to, you know, they wanted China's help against Soviet Union. And so they cut some kind of understanding. But um, so there are, there are keystone habits and that's, that's true at fractal scale also. You know, it's like there are keystone figures, you know, heroic figures in that, you know, we, we cherish them for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's how the body holds itself together uh, in a certain way. Lots of people refuse to go to the back of the bus, you know, but something about the way Rosa Parks did it, you know, at that moment, 
that was you know the linchpin and it yeah <laughs> so you know you can't predict those things right it's, they're omnivorously sensitive to uh, you know to uh local conditions it's it's no two snowflakes are alike and you don't know which one is going to turn out to become a diamond right yeah how many how many conditions were in just the right kind of position just, for that small action to have such massive consequences god god, god chose that person yeah it's yeah. not it's not enough to now I, I i saw i was at a talk at a reception for jane jacobs once and someone you know said you know she alone blah 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 and she you know she got up and said no i wasn't the only one lots of people saw what was going on i'm just the one who got the book contract and and but still she was chosen by god and she was a good choice you know having known her personally she was not uh you know she yeah. was not typical and, and just in terms of her integrity there was something there that i've only really ever seen in elders hmm. yeah well, how do you like that yeah that's wonderful i mean yeah um, and that's you know i can say that at age whatever my age is now and having you know traveled on i don't know five continents it's it's you know th there's it's a rare thing she, she yeah. wasn't just a smart person yeah she was a hero yeah i had something i was going to say but i it escaped me but father uh alexander alchinanov uh says some he has in one of his little diary entries it says yeah. I mean, there are people outside of the church who are born with such <laughs> oh, are born with such simplicity and integrity of heart that they just kind of are their whole lives in, in, in a profoundly influential way, but they're, you know, in a certain sense in indirect communion with the, with the spirit. And so they never even feel like the pull toward any sort of, any sort of, um, well, that was smart. He said that, huh? <laughs> he knew what he was talking about. And, and, and that they can't necessarily be convinced of like the gospel truth. Like the, the pull isn't there. Like the, 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 the word, you know, the word verbal expression of it doesn't resonate, but that's dangerous. You know, you, I, it's much better yeah. to be in the church. Yeah. 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 I mean, for for our, our own safety spiritually to have that nourishment yeah. of the body and blood of Christ, you know, who is, you know, the, the, the Eucharist is both, you know, as Maximus says in Ambiguum 10, I think, you know, Christ becomes the symbol of himself and, or so, something like that, you know, and, and it's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's the ultimate thing to, to, to encounter that. Yeah. Yeah. Fa you... Father Sir from Rose says, uh, said something like, uh, it's hard to be saved in the church. How much harder is it without, you know, um, so yeah, but and, I, and, and people hear that that on an individualistic level, and they recoil. I, I think we can leave that leave that statement aside. I mean, I, not knocking Seraphim Rose, who saved Orthodox Russia more or less single handedly, but the um, I mean through his writings. But the um, but it's it's clear at its civilization it's at civilizational scale. Yeah very hard to have a civilization without recourse to faith without recourse to the to to christ it's just not it's doable but you know those civilizations are always kind of looking on to christian societies at this point from whom they got the hospital from whom they got science from whom they yeah. got philanthropy on you know to to others from whom they got you know yeah I was, I'm reading The Pillar and Ground of the Truth by Father Pavel Ferensky right now. And he, he, he talks about how inextric, inextricable Christianity is from basically post-incarnation civilization everywhere. Um, from, 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 from what? From incarnation? Post-incarnation civilization. Oh, just oh, in, just yeah. ubiquitously. And he, he, he has some uh, quotations from some philosophers who are just sort of exacerbated their it, and you know Nietzsche is one of these one of these characters who looked at culture and was like, "It's just all Christian." And how are we? You know, like we can't 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 see through this exactly. It's just so implicated in every in every thread. So yeah, I think. I mean, 
we're living we're living in the consequences of what a nation without liturgy looks like so. well well certainly without without christian liturgy and like yeah. i said i don't i don't have a particular it's not like oh if there were more of us and fewer of them it would really make no difference the the, the issue is that um somehow the fire of the holy spirit has to descend upon us and the issue also is that, you know, I mentioned this in the book, that conservatives don't like this notion of, of, a, um, of, a, of social justice because they think, you know, that societies aren't persons, but they, but they are. And, 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 you know, we've done enough things as a society that even if you're the greatest saint, you won't necessarily be able to prevent your society from paying its price, paying, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's purgatorial fire here. I mean, it's, we just don't know where we're, where we're at on that scale. Yeah. So we, we, can, we can say we've done a lot of nice things for people. Right. It, yeah. It's one of those as a society, but and that, that's, that's true in a qualified way. <laughs> yeah no yeah i mean it's it's certainly not black or white i mean these again with this insofar as fractal complexity goes just uh, if you look at the injustice done to individuals all the way compounded up to to whole demographics and all of these things that it's also hard to assign i mean you can't assign responsibility to anyone but yourself in the end at the end of the day and to society as a whole has to repent and, and it's it's it has that that dimension and how do you go about that and it just we've i mean i don't know where we're at in our time frame here and whether how we're totally off your topics and if your audience cares about these things you know but you know we've we've made great um successive waves of attempts at reparations to african americans i mean the civil war being the first at least in lincoln's phrasing of it in the second inaugural address and then uh, certainly urban renewal was supposed to be that. And it, it immediately morphed into like a, a, a humiliation and destruction of African-American communities. Um, the welfare, you know, the Great Society welfare, I, I, you know, was supposed to be a reparations, just went horribly wrong. Um, what do you call it? Uh, this sort of, you know, uh, racial preferences in hiring, you know, was supposed to be that. I think that was on the whole, certainly more positive than urban renewal. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, and now, and here we go again, you know, for one more round of the, of the carousel. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's a shame because intellectuals and people who do this for a living write about these things should be taking the responsibility and the leadership to talk about what happened the last four times we did this and where it went wrong and really coming up with something germane. Yeah. Well, yeah, the money is there. The will is there. What's lacking is, is, is the humility and the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. And also the, right right the center. Yeah. The unknowing too. The, Cause you know, you talk about the, the objectification, the facelessness of, of a lot of these programs there, you know, these people, they're not seen as hypostases. It's like they're, they are, their numbers, you know, these demographics are, middle, low income, high income, however it is, and they can be they're puzzle pieces to be shaped and manipulated by a, you know, kind of abstract singular will in the void, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, 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 the thing is, at the end of the ethics of beauty in chapter eight, you know, when we get to the, you know, the discussion of science, you know, one thing that comes out is we have three kinds of science, you know, Jane Jacobs lays this out already in 1961. She got it from Warren Weaver, this very pivotal person in the history of, of science. And, and of these three kinds of science, one is beauty first, one is goodness first, one is truth first. We do need all three. And educationally, you know, we need to train people in all three. Um, uh, Personality wise, people are drawn to one or the other. And all of that is, is possible. Uh, it, you know, abstract social engineering of some, you know, perspective, or whatever, you know, we've gotten rid of smoking or whatever. Now everyone's fat. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's the, <laughs> I, 
I, I'm, I'm glad I live in a smoke-free world. You know, it's annoying. Yeah. Um, so, so um, you know, it, it's not that those things are impossible. It's just that the, 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 uh, the one-sided emphasis there and the ignorance of other possibilities. And then when, when they start, when they screw things up through these two simpler kinds of science, then they double down on the cruelty to try to make it work. And, and that's, you know, where, you know, you know, we've screwed up our farming completely and our farm communities through these, these ridiculous approaches. Yeah. Does this have something to do kind of with the patristic emphasis on the kind of skepticism of the imagination, not getting locked in your concepts. And again, this is a kind of that, um, being open to the otherness of, of situations where, you know, cause I can, I come to this conversation with you. I might have certain ideas. I have this program, you know, I want to go through and I could have it in mind the whole time, or I could actually listen to what you're saying and respond to it. Um, and so there's kind of this, this same thing where. You, know, you, you, can, you, you want to prep, you want to prep, you want to train yourself, you want to, you know, and then, and then gosh, but it's it's a good question because like you I think in in non combat situations let's say you know there's a lot to be said for throwing out the rule book like train hard and then in a, in a in in the actual environment just do you know what what you know you're seeing you know um, but I but I don't know there's a lot of times in life where you've just got to run the checklist. You know, before you can do anything else, you've got to run the checklist. And um, I, I think, I think it, it really, I think there's just, you know, there's a lot to be said for old age and there's a lot to be said for experience. And when you think about, you know, the miracle on the Hudson and, and Sully landing the plane and the, okay, these things happened. They went through all the checklists. They, they tried everything. Um, you know, that was part of the preparation, you know, all those years of training, you know, was, was preparation for relying on something else, all that years of his omnivorous aesthetic sensitivity to where am I actually, what am I doing? Not, we want to learn the archetypes, but when the archetypes break down and we realize we're in, in you know, virgin territory here, then like the virgin, we have to exercise unknowing and fly the damn plane. But he's not going to be able to fly it well if he doesn't also have, you know, if he doesn't in the moment go through that very linear process. Yeah. I thought then, the movie, but by the way, I thought the movie was a disaster, the, uh, the Sully movie. I, I, I would have made a terrible movie. I would have made a movie where the, the three things he could have done, return to LaGuardia, Teterboro, you know, that they had shown those first, you know. Mm. Like 40 minutes in the film, everyone dies. 40 minutes later, they all die again or whatever. This time in Tito Bro. And then, and then, and then that sweet water landing of what really happened. Um, but they didn't, they didn't run it that way. I think my, my approach would have been traumatizing for the I, people on that plane. I think, yeah, that would have been a nice way of doing it. I know the story, but I haven't seen the, uh, I haven't seen the film. But yeah, that, that would have been pretty dramatically they effective. This fake, this fake, um, uh, a fake witch hunt against him, which didn't really happen from the NTSB or something like that. So, hmm. you know, for dramatic effect. Yeah, make it a little more, have a little more intrigue. Yeah. Need, you remind need, need an enemy. Sorry. Um, you unless, you're me. unless you're Homer, you need an enemy, right? That's the message of uh, yeah. that's Simone Fay and, and of Jonathan Shea. Unless you're Homer. <laughs> no, yeah, I thought that was really, I, I, I found that. Uh, I think that ambiguity is, is something that, that is needed. I mean, there's just so much polarization in the way we tell stories now where it is very much black and white. And, well, and, oh. and po politics is a story and, and everything is, yeah. everyone is wanting to demonize someone. You don't really have to do that. You can you can go disarmed and and let the person you know they'll declare themselves if they're an implacable enemy they'll declare themselves as such at the right time you don't have to preload your your animosities 
Sure. And then even if they do, you don't have to respond in animosity. So what? Right. Yeah, there seems to be, I mean, this is, again, like on, on the individual level or uh, on the personal level. Like we are not, you know, except for those who are deified, we are not any of us like complete, totally good or bad. You know, we are, we are this kind of complex system of good attention and bad attention and all of these things and passions and, and, and maybe hospitality to noble thoughts at some times, but not maybe perhaps not very often. And so, yeah, this, this moralism is, is, uh, yes, the, 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 the wokesters, they're trying to turn the country into a monastery. They're trying to turn the entire country into you know, a religious community of a level of fervor that is so disconnected from ordinary reality of just biological human beings. Yeah. And in that, in that sense, it's like a monastery. Okay. It's just this other, this realm, this the religious utopia. Right. And, and you know what? Most of us don't have the monastic calling and that would be they. It's, it really, you know, it, it just, it's all about upping the stakes in order to get action. Yeah. But it's not, you need that Anglo-American hobbit sense <laughs> of comfort in the mundane. And, yeah. and you, have to, you have to start with, you know, family. And that means chastity. Because you can't have you can't have family without chastity, and you have to start with um, gratitude, and you know a real a real um, serious dedication to a habit of gratitude. You 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 you're just they're just going to blow everything up, <laughs> yeah. and, that's with, and that's with it. And I don't blame them. You know they have a strong religious sense there, and they want to you know. They, they want to see everything that has gone before as wicked and there's some future where everything's going to be bright. It's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. No, yes, it's, they, yeah, they are, they're on fire. They're on fire for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you can see these kind of through, throughout history, like these two streams, you know, kind of the Christian and, and the Gnostic, like the escapist and, 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 and all of these, yeah, like this this desire to kind of be ontologically angelic and be totally potential and and create your own sort of self-actualize your own own world, but also remake, you know, a world that they see as being imposed on them, which is, you know. Yeah, but 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 that's you know, it's not just the Gnostic thing. There's it's it's a monastic calling to live the angelic life. Sure. But yeah, yeah. Not imposed. Um in my one of you know, one of my side gigs here on um my, my film company, Beauty First Films, you know, we're doing this film about Saint Amphilochios Macris. And you know, he says to Saint Nectarios, when he, when he himself is like 17 and Nectarios is in 87 or something, you know, I mean, just, it's that much of a gap. And he says, I wish every person could be a monk or a nun. And Saint Nectarios says, you know, that would be the end of human race. And that's not yeah. really his plan. Anyway, Joseph, I think we need to cut this, uh, we need to bring this to a, to a landing here. What's our, what's our, uh, sure our exit strategy here our exit strategy can be i would if you have any um, ideas that you've been working on lately that are been, are that are novel to you i know probably they're they're more um for just further development of things you've been thinking about but in brief if there's anything that has been uh speaking to you or or taking up a lot of your attention lately i'd like to hear it it's 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 this thing that I already mentioned that this that's new. It's not in the book of of animal human person that progression um, in your spiritual life that you you cannot skip stages, and I I think it's really worth going to YouTube and just watching the old Dog Whisperer episodes and just seeing as many of them as you can or wherever you I don't know if you can buy that somewhere and. He's just, he's a wise counselor and, and he is able to take an anxious, uh, frightened, uh, hyper aggressive, a social lazy, it doesn't really matter what is, is the, is the kind of the, the soul malady of that dog and to rebuild them in a very, a very mild and natural way. And, um, 
I, I, you know, on this animal level, it's like, hey, you are a creature. And what do creatures do? They cry out to God for their food. And that's, you know, what fasting means that you've got to, you've got to don't go to McDonald's and don't go to an organic or a regenerative farm for your food. Go to God and, and cry out to God for your food and your sex. And then, and then through this ascetic practice, add to this almsgiving, which, you know, how you become human. It's not human that I have four winter coats and you have none. Now, okay, in this country, people don't lack winter coats. There's, you know, I remember just 10, 20 years ago, seeing a, a, a list of all the food re resources in Washington, D.C. For, for the homeless. I mean, it was just like more than the homeless could consume. You know, so, so, but in other ways, people do lack, right? The schools aren't properly funded. You know, um, college should essentially be free in the nation of our, of our wealth. Maybe students should work for it. I mean, work on campus. You know, maybe they should pay. It's a, it should be, you know, um, what about our libraries, our public spaces, our, you know, our public pools, our public gyms? I mean, the, the rich need to be, you know, they should have sold their Bitcoin, you know, six weeks ago. And <laughs> they, they, they need to become human again. They need to, to participate in this human project. Everything can't just be that when we have a little bit, our main fear, you know, our main concern is to hide it from the others. Yeah. And then you don't really become a person until you, your prayer life, you know, begins to mature. And that, you know, over the, over the Holy Scripture, within the liturgy, um, within the Jesus prayer, um, to give you the Protestant Catholic Orthodox uh, <laughs> you know, versions of that, but they're all important. And that's where personhood, you know, is, awaits us. And, you know, we, we just have to get better at that as a society. We need more spiritual counselors who are familiar, you know, with that animal, human, person sequence. And, um, and, and like you said, it's, it's just everything's Gnostic. Everything's a podcast. Everything's a talk. Everything's an insight. But people need a program, right? That's the great emphasis of the 12 steps. Well, the 12 steps, the fasting is built in. What you're fasting from is, you know, the thing you're addicted to. But, yeah. you know, for the rest of us, you know, it's the fasting of patterns of the church or whatever. It's, it's we have to get the physicality involved. And, 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 and then I would just say, you know, I mean, with every year that passes, I think it's just more urgent. A, a person should speak more urgently that really, I mean, just roll the dice on Christ just to make sure, you know, that just give him a chance. Give him a chance to be who he said he is. You know, yeah. the, the son of God and present at the foundation of the world. And don't overthink yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Why? What, what is it? You know, it's, there's not like a quiz at the end. This don't over, you know, of your, you know, your deathbed or something. Oh, I failed. That, that is Gnosticism, right? There's a quiz after you die. Right. The age of the, like these toll houses. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not really new, but I, I just think it's, it's important to, uh, that. No, that it, yeah. Progression. I think it's, yeah, it's good. It's, it's really, really good and that's again you know with your with your beauty first is like move, moving moving inwards and and this asceticism of the making the making beautiful you know like like uh F father pavel frensky really emphasizes in the salt of the earth like the countenance of saints and you you do this as well is 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 truly human you know is truly truly personal yeah so well, you know, he, he didn't figure that out. You know, he saw, he saw it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it wasn't an intellectual thing. That's yeah. yeah. That's exactly. No, that's, yeah. It's he cheated. He yeah, was, he cheated. Yeah. 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 He, he had you know something. Right. Well, thank you, Doctor Timothy. Um, really appreciate your time, and this was wonderful. I uh, 
if you ever want to do this again, I have more questions for you. So, um, but yeah, your, your time is very valuable to me and I appreciate this. Well, I, I suppose it should be valuable to me. I mean, so I'm running out of it. We don't, we all are. We don't. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Your time is valuable to me too. And I'm, I'm honored and grateful to be uh, thought of. And I, I hope, you know, um, I don't know if you can put a link to the St. Nicholas Press website mm -hmm. because we're trying yeah. to, you know, sell out of the, you know, small presses need to kind of sell out of their runs so they can afford the next printing. And the, yeah. Um, and um, and also I wanted to put in a plug for Hellenic College. We st still have openings for the fall. A lot of, it's, it's really is, um, it is, uh, you know, it's a magical place and it, it's not like, you know, college is great wherever you go, but, but there's some extra magic here that you kind of have to be ready for. Yeah. Because, you know, it's a twofold anointing, but. Um, if you, if anyone listening to this is looking for a college this summer, we'll take your application, you know, the day we open, if, if you can, because we we're really undersubscribed at the moment as, you know, college admissions are declining across the country, you know, as the yeah. demographic. Um, yeah, there's just those two things. I mentioned beauty first films as well. And that's, you know, yes. you can subscribe us there. And, but, but really, I mean, you know, God bless the people listening. I mean, you don't, they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The one man lost, right? Yeah. 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 yeah God almighty. <laughs> God help us. All right, Joseph. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Actually, if you'll stay on for just a second. Sure. Go ahead and pull up the recording.